Hey Wargamers, last week Games Workshop gave us a really cool preview of the Tau Manta, and although the Manta is not something that we expect to see in competitive play at all, and it is something that is far out of reach of most Wargamers out there, the Manta itself does give us a pretty good idea about some big changes and the design philosophy behind Tau going into 10th edition. So that's what we're going to do today is pick apart this preview, try to infer a few things about what the faction as a whole is going to look like once we get our new rules, and uh, explore some of the consequences of those for the 10th edition Tau army. All right, so if we start on the front of the data card, we see a lot of stuff that you know makes sense is mostly what we expected. Uh, 20 inch minimum movement, toughness 14, 2 up save, 5 up involve. That is an improvement over the 3 up uh, save that I used to have. Uh, 60 wounds, leadership 7 up, and objective control of 0. That is an interesting inclusion there at the end that it doesn't can count for anything for objectives. It can't control objectives at all. So uh, if you're planning on just bringing a Manta, uh, sorry, <laughs> that's not going to do anything for you in a game. But um, yeah, so stat line is noticeably similar with a little bit of improvement in a few places uh, as far as the abilities go it has deadly device 3d6 yeah it explodes it has hover that's good um importantly hover does unlock a lot of functionality for aircraft it basically allows them to base uh, avoid a lot of the negative consequences of being an aircraft so hover is good for the manta but also is a good thing to have for uh you know any flyer really uh faction for the greater good we'll talk about that in a moment uh very important to note that it does have for the greater good uh aggressive deployment this is a really cool ability it says in your shooting phase after this model has shot select one enemy unit hit by one or more of those attacks until the end of the phase each time a friendly model that disembarked from this transport this turn makes an attack that targets that enemy unit you can re-roll the wound roll so you get a uh, re-roll wounds that's pretty awesome uh air cast colossus basically means you have to spend more cp anytime you target the manta with a stratagem makes sense it's a giant ass model you probably need to spend more cp to to do something on it cool uh and then uh when it's damaged you know down be- down uh below 20 wounds uh you subtract one to the hit roll that's uh, pretty standard And then we get into some more interesting stuff with the weapon profiles, and we're going to break this down in just a moment, but as a brief overview, we have the heavy rail cannon with devastating wounds, we have the ion cannon with a standard overcharge uh, profile, both of those are blast, but the overcharge is hazardous, we have the long barrel burst cannon array, the missile pod, and... uh, what six seeker missiles i think um yeah so it has a bunch of seeker missiles uh which are still one shot and then its melee weapons are its armored hull now in 10th edition the abilities on a data card are totally customizable right so the ion cannon for a manta isn't necessarily the same as the ion cannon on a hammerhead those two could potentially have different profiles including different ballistic skills or other attributes so what we see on the Manta data card isn't necessarily a one-for-one indicator of what we would see on other unit profiles. However, that probably is going to be something that they are relatively uh, conservative about. So maybe ballistic skill changes, but a lot of the key attributes probably do not. So let's look at the ion cannon here. We probably see a bunch of things that are similar here as to ion cannons on other models, namely the hammerhead. Uh, and the biggest thing that I see is that the ion cannon is not heavy, right? So it's always going to be hitting on fours. That's true for the Manta in ninth edition. The Manta had a ballistic skill of four up. So the ion cannon hitting on a four up here totally makes sense. Uh, but the fact that it's not heavy means that you can't remain stationary to get the bump on uh, your ballistic skill, right? So you can't keep your Manta stationary to hit on threes. You can't keep your Hammerhead stationary to hit on threes, assuming that the Manta also has a ballistic skill of four up. Hopefully it doesn't, right? Hopefully the uh, Hammerhead at least has a three up ballistic skill, but Either way, you're not getting any buff from a heavy keyword on this. So that's a little bit concerning. I would expect that Tau weapons in general would have had the heavy keyword in order to emphasize some elements of their their play. But uh, that's not, not true here, at least. Um, we see that the damage is now D6 plus 3 instead of 3D3. Uh, that gives a slight bump to... Uh, damage output right like your minimum is four instead of three uh, and you are um, getting a little less variable output so that's a little bit of a buff there Um, your standard ap is now minus one instead of minus two that's something that i would expect to play out across 
the uh, diversity of ion weapons, right, is that we're not having as strong of AP on the standard profile. When we look at the missile pod, uh, that's not assault. And we saw that with the drone preview as well, uh, that missile pods are not assault weapons, which is kind of wild to me. Um, perhaps this is something unique to or relatively restricted because of the conceptualization of the missile pod being a long range weapon, that perhaps as a long range weapon, you are not expecting to necessarily have to advance and shoot um, the weapon. But uh, nonetheless, the fact that it's no longer an assault weapon uh, means you can't advance and shoot. And that's a really big deal for things like crisis suits, right? Like crisis suits are meant to be dynamic. We want them to be able to, uh, you know, <laughs> advance and shoot. And so the loss of assault is potentially an indicator of sweeping reductions in uh, crisis suit efficacy and maneuverability uh, if if we're assuming that a large number of formerly assault weapons are no longer assault. Um, the AP here is also reduced uh, from negative two to minus one, and that's consistent with kind of some of the language that we've heard from Games Workshop about reductions in AP across the board. So that uh, that fits with what we know already. The Seeker Missile, uh, we see the range reduced from 72 to 48 inches. Uh, I don't totally get that like <laughs> I you know I get the changes in AP uh the reduction in seeker missile range is kind of um this seems like a little bit of something out of left field I suppose uh but uh, okay um you know functionally that doesn't make much difference most of the time uh a lot of times you're going to be within 48 inches and so that's that's fine it's just kind of weird uh strength up from 9 to 14 again we're seeing a scaling a stretching out of profiles here so the seeker missile moving up to strength 14 makes sense and is a welcome change uh perhaps this is why they uh have reduced the range a little bit is because it is going to punch a little bit harder uh, and the damage is increased from 2d3 to d6 plus 1 uh so 2d3 your minimum is 2 D6 plus 1, your minimum is also 2, but here you're getting um, uh, potential for 7 damage instead of just 6. So there's a, a really minor uh, change to your uh, output there. And you also get um, a little bit more uh, granularity uh, with that as well. Uh, the heavy rail cannon profile, this is something that um, you know is not not super informative because we don't see heavy rail cannons present in the main codex units but uh, if we're looking at this indicator of how they are approaching rail uh, it's interesting that there's no special rule on the model to improve critical wounds right like one of the things that i really expected to see with with rail um, was anti-vehicle for example uh, as a keyword we know that that wasn't the case in the hammerhead uh, preview that that there was there was no anti-vehicle keyword but i was thinking perhaps maybe the unit itself would have some sort of uh, modification to that but that's not the case um, we don't see that so uh, there's no no modification no no special rules for the unit to to make rail more effective it's just what you see is what you get on that um, also notably here is that rail vehicles will be very good at tank shock so tank shock is a stratagem uh a mechanic that's returning where you basically take a vehicle and ram it into something uh because the the manta has hover you can basically tank shock with it and uh the important part here is that it's all based off your weapon's strength and the target unit's toughness so uh Heavy Rail Cannon has Strength 26, which means if you ram a Manta into something, it is going to uh, do a lot of mortal wounds, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of a fun fun mechanic there is that you could ram your Manta or, you know, more realistically, your Hammerhead into something. Um, it's going to have Strength 20 instead of Strength 26. But nonetheless, uh, having a high strength weapon on a tank is going to make tank shock a really effective way of dishing out at least a few mortal wounds to a wide variety of targets. And because you have big guns never tire, you can shoot in into and out of combat with your vehicles. So uh, that is pretty darn cool. Uh, that's one kind of melee esque element of Tau that is uh, I don't know if it's returning or new, uh, depending on how you define it. But having uh, <laughs> Having the ability to tank shock with rail weapons is, is pretty awesome, and we see that manifested in this preview here. 
When we look at the back of the data card, uh, it has no word gear options, which, yeah, makes sense. Unit composition is one Manta. Um, it has, you know, two rail cans, six ion cans, two long barrel burst cannons, two missile pods, 10 seeker missiles. Okay, so it's 10 seeker missiles. I think I said that wrong to begin with. It's 10. Doesn't matter. Uh, but, <laughs> but yeah, and it has this armored hull. Uh, the interesting part here is the transport capacity. So the transport capacity is 200 Tau Empire infantry or tactical drone models. Uh, four Delfish Skyray or Hammerhead, and eight battle suits with a wounds characteristic of nine or less. So a few big takeaways here. Uh, for the transport capacity, having 200 infantry or tactical drone units is really important because it means that tactical drone units still exist, right? This was one of our big questions uh, coming into 10th after the faction focus was, what the heck happens to tactical drone units if drones themselves are now just war gear? Well, it seems pretty clear based on this that attached drones are just war gear, but tactical drone units still remain models, which is a little unintuitive. That's that's kind of a little a little messy, right? That some drones are real and other drones are not. But nonetheless, that's the distinction that they're going with, it seems. Uh, it means that drone units, yeah, still exist. So you could have a unit of gun drones hanging around. You have a unit of marker light drones or, you know, shield drones or whatever. You can have um, three units of drones because of the, the way that they're doing army composition in 10th. And that's cool. You can have those. Uh, but importantly, this means that the hope for savior protocols as a stratagem is still alive, right? You could have something where it says, you know, if a tactical drone unit is within six inches of a unit that's being targeted, you know, play the stratagem, destroy a number of drones to, you know, prevent X amount of damage or whatever. Um, so that is probably how savior protocols will work if they work at all. Um, no longer dealing with the potential for um, having to give up uh, you know, war gear or anything like that. It's just going to be the tactical drone units. Take one for the team is my guess. Um, if saber protocols exist, which we still don't know, uh, transport capacity, uh, being for battle suits with nine or less wounds. This is interesting because that's exactly what it is in ninth, right? That means that crisis suits, commanders, broadside, stealth suits, all those can fit in a Manta in ninth edition. And, it seems very much like this might single signal that there is no increase to bow suit wounds characteristics, right? Or, right, maybe it just means that they're not meant for broadsides anymore if there are increases to wounds. But basically, if it's nine or fewer wounds and we're sticking with the same models here, uh, broadsides have to be, you know, eight or nine wounds, right? Like, there's no, there's no actual increase really right so i'm really concerned that this means that crisis suits don't see an increase in in wounds characteristic commanders don't see an increase in wounds characteristic anything like that um and that's pretty unbelievable i mean it's not unbelievable but it's uh disappointing given the changes to drones right if drones are no longer providing a blade of wounds as a whole uh the fact that wounds characteristics on those suits themselves are not increasing to at least partially compensate for that that's uh that's not great right like we really wanted more wounds on our battle suits to make them be able to take a little bit more of a punch than they used to on their own um, because a lot of the durability of those suits in the past was based on their drone uh friends and so now that we lose those drones they're a lot more vulnerable if we got wounds, a few wounds back, it wouldn't be um, the same as having those drones because of the way that wound allocation works, but it would give a little bit of that durability. It would just give a, a, a really, it would just give a, a small fraction of that durability back in order to only partially compensate. But it seems like Games Workshop is not making that choice. And so we should expect battle suits to be basically the same wounds as they have been, maybe go up by one. Um, but that's about it. And then I said we were going to talk about the faction keywords here. So it has for the greater good and it has the marker like keyword. Um, that's interesting in two ways. One is that it means that vehicles can have for the greater good. We were expecting this for the most part uh, because having things like hammerheads without access to for the greater good was going to be a major issue. So having 
uh, confirmation here that the Manta has for the greater good. Seems like a pretty good indicator that um, vehicles at least will have for the greater good. Uh, that's good news all around. Uh, and then also it has the marker like keyword, which I'm I don't know if I'm surprised by that, but um, right. Originally, the Manta, at least in ninth edition, had six marker lights. So all those marker lights are being replaced with, you know, the marker like keyword. Um, and there's no modification to that. There's nothing that says it uh, it can be a spotter for multiple units or anything like that, which which I suppose is the surprising part, right? Like you would think that a model and a unit the size of the Manta would be able to serve as a spotter for multiple units but alas that's not the case um, and so there's no modification for it previously having six marker lights or anything like that it still just can be a spotter for one unit um, which okay I guess that's fine um, but overall there's some pretty big changes here right we got some cool confirmation about for the greater good we got some confirmation about tactical drones those were really big things and overall we saw a little bit more about how Tau are going to manifest in 10th edition. So let me know what you think in the comments below. Is this exciting? Are there things that you uh, picked up on that I missed? Put them in the comments and we'll have a conversation. As always, thanks for watching and happy wargaming. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. If you want to pick up one of the Invasive Wargaming models before they become unavailable, uh, head on over to the Invasive Wargaming Etsy store in the description below. Uh, also, if you like this video, you should know that it is made possible by my kind sponsor, The Magnet Baron, as well as the excellent folks over on Patreon. Uh, if you want to support the channel, you can certainly hop on over there and join our community. Special thanks to Shifty, Durza, Everett Keller, Stephen Cowan, Jack Inacker, Jared Egler, and Scott Heater. Sure.